Well, everybody, welcome to York History Group. My name is Kevin Freeman. Tonight, we're going to continue our series on religion in early York, Complexity and Conflict, Part 5. Uh, tonight, we're kind of making an exception. We're going to sort of like subtitle this, Joseph Handkerchief Moody, and we're going to talk about the life of Joseph Moody. And um, I'm always so excited to have Danny Bettino and James Kansas join me. Um, I just I just love being in their presence and learning so much about them. Um, I just want everybody to know before we get started too, that we are each referencing uh, Joseph Moody's diary, which was uh, transcribed from Latin by um, Philip McIntyre Woodwell. Um, I don't know what year that that was, but Danny can probably tell us in a minute. The way we're going to launch tonight's uh, segment is James is going to start by painting us a little bit of picture of what the town of York was like in the early 1700s during the time of Joseph Moody's life. And then Danny's going to pick it up and he's going to tell us a little bit of well, what it was like to be going to church at that time and to have the minister, either Father Moody, Samuel Moody, or his son Joseph, perhaps at the pulpit um laying down the religious laws <laughs> so thank you guys for joining us tonight and james we're going to pass it over to you okay well okay um as everybody knows of course in the uh, last decade of the 17th century the uh, indian raid occurred that um was responsible for both you know reverend dummer's death and and certainly the deaths and captivities of a large number of portions of the population and the town uh, in the decade following that was recovering from, from that episode. And one of the um, necessities was of course to find someone to succeed Reverend Dummer. And after a period of individuals who had um, brief period, periods of presence here, they um, established uh, the, the ministry of Reverend Samuel Moody. Within just a few years of the end of uh, King William's War, uh, another French and Indian War basically uh, erupts, and this is Queen Anne's War. And this will continue from 1703 up until 1713, an entire decade. And of course, um, what's important about Queen Anne's War for York is the number of, of, of incidents of, of attacks in town. And, and loss of life uh, that occurred, probably greater than any of the era of the Indian Wars, Queen Anne's War. And, and they are clustered in periods of time, clustered in you know, 1704, and then clustered in the middle of the period, and then clustered towards the end of the period. So I think one of the starting points of understanding Joseph Moody is he's born into that. He is born in May of 1700, and he's just a very small child when the war begins. And by the time that he's, you know, in his adolescence, the war has been going on throughout the entire time of his childhood. And I think it's a starting point for understanding Moody, because it is during that time of Queen Anne's War that he has this uh, accidental shooting of the Preble boy. And, you know, it's hard to tell from the diary the psychic impact of the shooting. But given his nature, his temperament, I think it's impossible for him to ever escape from it. I think it's just one of those events that probably hangs over his head throughout the course of his life. Now, Junkins, you know, based upon the, the evidence that Junkins has consulted, he can find no, no signs of that. But I, I think a closer reading of the diary and, and I think a sense of how Moody responds to, to deaths um, reveals indeed that every time these, these deaths occur in town, he's confronted once again with the realization of, of this accidental death of, of, mm -hmm. the, of the purple boy. So mm -hmm. uh, Queen Anne's War ends in 1713. Um, very quickly at the conclusion of the war has happened throughout the 18th century. As soon as the war ends, there is this evidence of, of, of mill being established and um, 
expansion into parts of town that until that time were uninhabitable, and that's of course occurring in the period after 1713. Then Dummer's War begins just as Moody's entering in his late teens, early 20s. And it, it begins where the, um, essentially it's a, it's a consequence of Queen Anne's War. Um, the, the resettlement of those, those, those parts of the North that had basically been abandoned during Queen Anne's War has pushed settlement closer and closer toward the tribal territories of the natives to the north and it's impinging upon those tribal territories and they're reacting against that. And Dummer's war from the period of the early 1720s up until 1725 is gonna be another event and it's all in the background of the diary. And York is not going to experience any loss of life, at least no indication of any loss of life during Dummer's war, but it lives with the realization of the potential for uh, some kind of an attack because in all of the contiguous towns, Berwick and Wells, there are indeed incidents and you read the diary and you can sense the, the, the close relationship of these towns to York and the, and the threat that they pose mm -hmm. over the course of the 1720s. So that's in the diary, Moody mentions that someone in York said that natives had shot at him and had pierced his uh, jacket, uh, but Moody was skeptical. And then another man mentioned that uh, he had been walking and that Indians had stolen his, his dog, but they had not harmed him. So there were, so there were, those were, I believe the only two incidents of the war that Moody says actually happened in New York. Both of them are somewhat, uh, somewhat strange. Well, and um, a garrisons are constructed. Um, there's a military watch that's established. That's, there's, that's indicated in the diary. Most importantly, there's a constant movement of soldiers through town. And, uh, you know, Moody documents this, this occurrence. He also documents the occurrence of the high military commanders like uh, Westbrook and Penhallow are coming through here quite uh, quite often. Mm -hmm. So so York is really a kind of focal point for for the Massachusetts action during Dummer's War, and that's pretty clear. That's pretty clear in the diary. Yeah. And of course, York is where the uh, the final raid uh, led by Harmon and um, Moulton leaves yeah. from in seventeen twenty four. Right. The raid on right, right. Um, Norwich Walk. Which Moody does talk about in the in the diary, and then and then uh, in 1725, uh, as the war is, is approaching its close, um, this is when Joseph Sayward uh, and his mill partners form the new mill company that's you know located um, what is now you know Barrow Mill Pond. Interestingly, Joseph Moody will become one of the shareholders in the mill company. Mm -hmm. Sort of, it's sort of a, 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 yeah. a kind of an unusual role for an individual who you know has the, the training of the ministry, but he is indeed one of the shareholders in the in the mill mill company. Now, as you've mentioned to me, James, you you do see this restarting of a a new mill company, seventeen twenty five, as a gesture of York's uh, rebuilding of uh, trying to get something going now that the war has uh, ended. Now that York is in a more peaceful state. There's this sense that uh, that that's a primary uh, motive for the uh, for the uh, starting of the of the mill company in 1725. Well, yeah, and you see the actual date of the yep. establishment of the mill company. It seems symbolic because it is the anniversary of the Candlemas raid. Yeah, it's January 25th, exactly 1725. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So a, a a gesture there, I think, by the the founders of, of the mill company say that our town was almost wiped out on this date, January 25th, 1692. And now 30 years later, we are, we yeah, are it, building it, the it, town up to a new, the new, new mill company sort of marks the end of, yeah. of what is the, the immediate threat the Indians posed exactly to the town over the 50 years from King Philip's war, right up until the end of Dummer's war. Right. Yeah. All right. So, so at this uh, point, can I just say, at this yes. point, um, the town of York is 
come into complete compliance with Massachusetts. Um, we have representatives there and um, we are just acting as a, a town in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and oh, also, yeah. also, can Danny, can as you talk about yes. religion during this time, can you can you tell a little bit about um, Handkerchief Moody's or Joseph Moody's diary? Um, hmm. A little bit about maybe how it was found and that yeah. it wasn't even that it was written in what people refer to as a code. Yeah, I mean, some of the history of the yeah, I, I can start with that, and then I'll go into what it was like to go to. Uh, a uh, a uh, service or a um, a um, a meeting is what Joseph usually calls them at uh, York in the 1720s. But we have this source here, this this diary of of Joseph Moody, and from the first entries in the extant portion of the diary, which is I have seen the actual physical Ooh. book. It is held in the Brown Library in Portland. And you can order it if you want. Anyone can uh, do that. And it's about this big. It's very a very very small book. I say it's about four four inches tall, four inches wide. Um, so it's a pretty small book. He could probably fit it in his pocket easily and uh, carry it with him, which I think that's how he brought it with mm -hmm. him on his uh, journeys, which he mentions in the diary. And we'll be talking about that. It goes on quite quite a few journeys. He rides down to Boston, to Gloucester, and so on. I think he was bringing this this book with him. Four, fourteen and times, fourteen times in all, he goes down to Massachusetts. Fourteen times, excellent. And I have made a list of every town that he mentions <laughs> that he visited in the diary. So we can go over that later, but. Um, 19 towns that he mentions by name as having been been to in the diary, counting York. Uh, so I'll go over that list later, but he certainly does do a lot of traveling. So I think that's perhaps one of the reasons why the book is so small. The other reason is that books were very valuable. Paper was very valuable and was very rare in this, in this period. In documents of, of this time, you often see on a, a deed, say, on the back of the deed, scribbles or sometimes math or someone. People were using these papers to write, to, to do math problems or to write things on, even though these were, you know, uh, legal documents because this was the only paper that they had. They didn't, or they didn't want to take out a whole new blank piece of paper because paper was uh, somewhat rare. Uh, and one of his entries, I think Moody mentions that someone gave him paper. So this was something notable that he would write about in his diary. So that's probably, a secondary reason for why the diary was, was so small, it was simply cheaper. And in the diary, he writes in a very, very small script. And it's in, for the most part, not all, sometimes he writes in plain English cursive, but for the most part, it's in this code that you mentioned, Kevin. And in the printed version of the diary, there is a photograph of what this script, what this code script looks like. So let me, yeah, here it is. This is it. It's on page 97, it's after page 97. Mm, mm, mm. But this, this is it here, so you can see, this is what his code looks like. And I do think it's modeled after shorthand codes of, of the time. Shorthand first became popular in England in the early 1600s and was widely used in, in diaries of this period. Pepys, Samuel Pepys, most, kept the most famous diary in uh, English history, very probably used a standard shorthand of the period to write his diary in the 1660s. Now, I think Moody's code, code is not a standard shorthand, but he probably used shorthand systems to create the symbols. And we see these symbols and what letters they mean on the back page of the printed diary is this here. So this is the code. This is how you, you can read what's in the diary. And what this photograph is here is this is written on the back page of the diary book, oh. this, this key to the code here. So you, you would ask, why would Moody write this? Why, why would he bother to put it in, in code if he put the key to the code on the back of the book? Now, I, I think that he didn't do that. I think this is in a different hand. I think, uh, I can't remember if Woodwell speculates this too. He might in his intro. I think that this was written by Moody's, one of Moody's uh, sons. Uh, yeah, who, that's- I, 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 I think that's very possible. Yeah, that's very possible. Thomas, 
Thomas, Thomas Moody, Moody probably. Thomas Moody kept a diary himself. Right. Right. Uh, throughout so, the period of the Seven Years' War. So you don't exactly. think that would be a, you don't think that would be a violation of his of his father's confidence? Well, if his father gave him the diary, maybe that's how he justified it. So I, I mean, if his father didn't want people to read it, he would have burned it. So yeah, so you're certain of that. You, you yeah. oh, was, was he ambivalent about it? Was he maybe letting... right? Yeah. So that that's a big exactly. Question. Peeps was too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. Keep sorry to distract you. See, it's oh, no, very, that, it's very interesting. Excellent point. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting because Thomas Moody's diary during the Seven Years' War is also a very small book, a booklet, you know, type of a small booklet. So it's very interesting how similar they seem to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, his, and his entries are very personal. And a lot of it's about, you know, I prayed, I went into the woods and prayed today. I prayed for, for four hours yesterday. I didn't pray. And so it's kind of like like the the ideal Christian is supposed to be praying in private, um, yep. and so I'm like, oh, so he was writing really private things, and he wouldn't be writing these to people because he would have read the scriptures and he would have understood that you, you don't pray in public. Although he was a minister, yes. he did that too. So, anyways, I, I was just curious about that. Yes, he well, does I, mention I, private prayer, right? Yeah, he mentions how much he values private prayer in the diary. Yeah, yeah, but James, yeah. Well, it, it's very interesting. Now, he constantly says, I was hilarious. I, I, you know, I was frivolous. I, you know, I, he will, he'll be talking to people. And this is what I think is really important because I think, this is what I think anyway. The problem is once somebody becomes a minister, their re social relationships change. So they no longer can maintain that informal relationship they might have had with individuals who are their contemporaries yeah. Yeah. they're suddenly elevated above that and and for him to want to be with those people that were of his age and people that that he had known throughout his life and suddenly not be able to relate to them in that way that that would be comfortable for him i think is a great source of conflict i think that no. you know when no. he when he's talking to the young students and he seems to you know want to be informal and suddenly he cautions himself oh i'm i'm being you know frivolous i shouldn't be like this over and over again he seems to reach this point and i think i think this is where you get the real sense of this man of being very sociable a very mm -hmm. uh, he enjoys just just the 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 normal activities that other people are experiencing, but he can't. At a certain point, he realizes he's not allowed to do that anymore. Yep. It's not yeah. possible for him to do it anymore. You know, yep. you know, you talk yeah. about the stilts, for example, or or going fishing, or or going hunting, or all of those things. Or singing, this, even. What? All right, singing. Yeah, you know, just, sometimes he feels guilty about singing. Just wanting to be like everybody else, and he's not allowed to do that anymore. And I, I increasingly, when I read the diary, I see a man trapped by his career. I mean, I think, uh -huh. I think Banks, Banks is speaking too strongly. I don't think it's a matter of, you know, somebody who's um, in a position where they, um, you know, they've been has has this imposed upon them. I think the problem for him is that he realizes that this position that he's in will no longer allow him to be the person he once was. And I think also, mm -hmm. and this may be important because he went down to Cambridge to school. And I think that he may have had experiences down there that were so distant, so remote from what he experienced up here that he was never able to fully separate what happened to him down there from, from what happens up here. And I think the same thing happens every time he goes down to Massachusetts. You get this sense of a man who sort of what breathes easy there from breathes easy because he's no longer in this the same thing this constraint. Right, and maybe that's why he, he goes down uh, to mass uh, so often. I mean, this is a a three day uh, horseback ride that he that yeah he usually goes, takes he goes him to, to get to he Boston. Goes to, he goes to Gloucester to see yeah. Lucy White and and her family. Of course, he's going to marry her you know in november of, of 1724 he goes to gloucester and then he goes to malden to see his sister who's married to reverend emerson right his sister lives in malden and then he goes to boston sometimes too and he goes to boston yeah. he goes to boston indeed he, he he has encounters with you know samuel sewell and and 
Yes. Individuals down in and Boston. Increase, increase Mather, he uh, meets once too, which is fascinating because Increase Mather dies in 1723. And, and Joseph mentions coming down and talking to him in Boston in 1722. He's in, he's in his, his 80s by then. So there's and, a link to the very and, earliest history. And, the and there's, something, there's something really interesting about Gloucester that I, I, yeah. I've, I've found really fascinating. There is, a, there is in Gloucester a large group of individuals who have connections to York living there. Yeah. And there are individuals also who have moved from Gloucester and have established connections with York out of Gloucester. Now, uh, Henry Sayward's son is one of those individuals who ends up down in Gloucester. And he's the first one who's referred to as Elder Sayward. It gets a little confusing because- Yeah, who is the uh, Elder Sayward, the, yes. Right, who's out, which <laughs> Elder Sayward is talking about, right? Mm. But there's, see, uh, Gustavus Norwood, that's a Gloucester family. Norwood is a Gloucester family. They end up up here. They have connections up here. So there's a kind of a neighborhood down in Gloucester. So he's going down to Gloucester to see the Whites and, and to see Lucy White is also part of his connection to this neighborhood of individuals yeah. that live down yeah. there. And, and we, we've, I, I don't think we have any sources as to why he was promised to marry Lucy, Lucy White. But I do think that it was probably his father's doing, uh, is at his father's, uh, sort of planning along with Lucy's father, uh, Reverend White, also a minister too. I do think that this was uh, forming this tight bond, a tighter bond between Gloucester and York, which was already close. And of course you have the two um, ministers families too. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting how Gloucester, closer. it's yeah. very interesting how Gloucester ties into York's history that way so, so Dan, yep. can we go but back to, anyway uh, yes yeah can we go back and can, now that we've gone forward again um can we go back yes. and talk a little bit about joseph moody's education too yes yes definitely yeah and i i wanted uh, i wasn't quite done with talking about the, the physical diary as a source yeah so okay. nice little footnote we, we had there but let's let's get get back to <laughs> to the diary as a source yes uh but there's so much to talk about here uh that it will, it will, we will only barely, barely scratch the uh the surface yeah you can, have, you can have multiple episodes on this right? oh yeah oh definitely so yes the 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 diary is in code but it's in latin too also most of the code when you translate it into the roman letters is in latin and this is Fascinating. Moody, Moody's first entries in the extant portion of the diary are in, in Latin in 1720 when he was 20 years old. So at 20, he had already graduated from Harvard in uh, Cambridge. I think he had graduated the previous year, 1719, I believe it was the class. Oh, 1718. Seven, I believe it was the class 18, of 1718. Yeah. Yes. Class of 1718. When he was eight, 18 years old, he got his, um, his bachelor's from Harvard, and then he moved back to, to uh, York. And so I would guess that he probably started writing a diary in Latin at around that time. And if you look at the first entries in the, the extant book of the diary, it's quite clear to me that this is not a diary that he's starting. This is a diary that he's already been keeping. Mm, he probably yeah. had a previous book, which he had used up and then moved to the extant book. Uh, Perhaps he had been keeping this diary for uh, years by the point that we have the first entries in the current book from 1720. And it is, I think, a testament to his scholarly knowledge that he's writing in, in fluent Latin all, you know, at the age of uh, 20 here. Let me just interject that he, he's not re really worried about grammar for somebody that went to Harvard and comes back and becomes a school teacher. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, I do you I I I have studied Latin, but my Latin is, is very poor. Did you get a chance to look at at the the page of uh, Latin that Woodwell oh, gives us? Well, what I'm saying is there's a lot of like, you know, one word sentences. Um uh, yes. Uh, 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 yeah, he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't waste any ink. Um I think that's part of it. I think the diary was so small he didn't want to write too much and also of course yeah. his latin certainly was not as good as his english was i think that's that's part of it yeah yeah, yeah. okay okay yeah, yeah. So, i understand <laughs> so, there's um this is from sewell's diary it's december 6 1711 mm. 
Cousin Moody dines with us and his son Joseph, whom he brings to send to school at Cambridge. So December 6, 1711, Queen Anne's War is still in progress. Queen Anne's War is, there are going to still be incidents with Queen Anne's War at that time. And I think that, I think for Moody to be free of, of that war atmosphere um, must have really been for him, given what, what we could judge from, from how he describes Dummer's War, it must have been just a, a freedom, a sense of freedom of just getting away from there. Yeah. So he was maybe in, in Boston for quite a while, maybe from about 1712 until 1718. I wonder when, if we can trace when he first went down to start studying at uh, Cambridge. I think, I think well, Rimmel does talk about that. Um, yeah, he does mention that. Yeah. Well, he, 1711, I mean, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's beginning is he's going to be yeah. attending school down in Cambridge. Before yeah. Harvard, right? Right, right. Goes to prep school. So it's, it's right. So it's to prepare for, you know, he's going to to Harvard. But you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is that that he's still it's Queen Anne's War is still going on. Yeah. He's he's yeah. getting out of that that garrison world towards you know a place where where he must feel safer than he, well but, than you know he, he did before. Right. It would be safer, definitely. Yeah. But, but I think he had a he had a. Uh, self insecurity um, about himself also, so we can only kind of like speculate um, where he lived, how he lived. Yes, um. and I on this uh, one little little note here before we we move on on this topic of feeling safe during wartime. I do think that although Moody, of course, is very nervous and naturally, of course, there was a real danger to to York for everyone living in York in the 1720s. He, I don't think, is. You know, um, I don't think we can blame him too much. And there is towards the end of the diary, I forgot his name because there was a real danger. I forgot his name, but there is this this uh, peer of Moody's that Samuel brings up from Harvard to help him teach the school. Uh, he has a French sounding name, and this guy is very well educated. Um, and he uh, he he. He um, Moody writes in, in, the, in the diary that this guy doesn't come to uh, school because he has too much fear, and then so you're thinking what what is he scared of? And then you, as you read later later entries, it becomes clear that he's just petrified of the Indian raids on the town. Yeah, wow. and so he's so scared that he doesn't want to leave the uh, garrison or his his house to go to 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 teach school. Whereas Moody, that's what he always does. So it doesn't seem that. Out of the ordinary to him but for yeah. someone coming from the safety of boston yeah. to york in the 1720s yeah they're so terrified that they can hardly they can hardly move through the town well and and, and you know they're garrisoning the parsonage yeah. i mean the parsonage yeah. is garrison with the yeah. fortified walls around it yeah um, um I, I have a personal question um it's uh it, it, that is about Nathaniel Freeman, your school teacher at the yes. same time. Yes. And, um, he was given a schoolhouse down on Lilac Lane and he lived in there with his wife. And um, so these two were living contemporaneously. And I noticed, I noted that uh, Joseph made reference that Freeman was doing the ciphers. So I assumed that that was the younger children um, that would probably have been right in the village. And then Joseph was moving around town as a teacher. Actually, we're kind of skip. I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit. Um, yeah. But, but actually, I'm not really sure because Joseph comes back from Harvard and I believe he begins teaching right away. I think so. Yeah. 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 So he's got Freeman in, in one like a, a designated area to teach, I assume, because that's what the literature says that I've read. And then um, he's kind of like moving around from school district to school district, living. Yeah, they have this. They have this. Um, yeah. This rotating position where the schools are located. Yeah, but they did have a they did have a schoolhouse down there on uh, 103 and York Street. Um, Was there a schoolhouse there in in Joseph's time in the 1720s? Yeah, and and because the selectmen, there was a meeting, and uh, they designated so much money for it, and they voted to pay Nathaniel Freeman. They talk about they talk know, about a um, yeah. 
<laughs> they talk about a, a, a there's a in the town records they talk about making use of a schoolhouse in the village <laughs> for a poor house that that's huh. a, 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 a period of, of decisions being made at the town meeting to make use of this building for for a poor house uh, then then they uh, then they reverse their decision but at least does indicate that there is a schoolhouse in school the village house. now towards the end of the diary freeman dies is this the the same freeman who you think was teaching the the small yeah, children he, he died in 17 nathaniel freeman yeah nathaniel freeman the school teacher died in yeah. 1727 and he had a kid, a son named Nathaniel also. So, um, Well, there's a Freeman who dies in Joseph's diary in 1723, I think, or 1724. Is that the same Freeman? Yeah, that's, I'm a little unsure about that. Um, let me look it up. So there's quite a few entries about his death. It's quite a notable death for Joseph. I know that Alice Joseph. died. I, I know that Here, Alice let, me, uh, let me go get uh, the uh, genealogical dictionary. Aha, uh -huh. that's yes. Yeah, but I don't want to digress. <laughs> I, I don't want to digress. I want to stay focused too. Um, yeah, so let's stay focused. Uh, <laughs> yeah, James can, can look. Oh, yes, I see. I see the Freemans in the index here. Nathaniel Freeman. Yeah. Uh, Nathaniel Freeman Sr. dies in the, the diary, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yes, it? yes, here, here it is. October, October 1723. Yes. Um, Mr. Freeman died about 9 or 10 a.m. on October 2nd, 1723. And earlier in September, Joseph writes that um, father wanted me to visit Master, Master Freeman but it did not please me to write from Freeman's dictation. So Father Moody said that he didn't go to, didn't need to go see him on his deathbed. Um, and then it says later on though, Joseph does go see him. He writes together with my mother, I visited Freeman suffering from ex uh, extreme pain. And to me as well as to others, it seemed that he would not long live, survive. Yeah. So and then he dies a few days later. Yeah. So, so Danny, I'm just going to go back to 1701, and uh, yes, I found this on one of the old maps. Um, it, it, and it's on my tree on ancestry. It, it's schools. The first recorded action taken in regard to schools was in 1701, when Nathaniel Freeman was employed by the selectmen for eight pounds per year with three D per week for teaching, reading, and four D per week for writing and ciphering. His year began May 5th. This is kind of short. So um, the next year he was engaged for 10 L, same price for other branches. In 1709 to 10, the selectmen were instructed to, by vote of the town to hire a schoolmaster for seven years to teach all the town to read, write, and cipher. The next year, Nathaniel Freeman was engaged for the term of the years mentioned. He was to teach from 8 a.m. and from 1 to to 5 p.m. for 30 pounds per year paid quarterly, la, la, la. In addition, the town was to build him a house 22 by 18 with a brick chimney. The school was to be free to all from five years old and upwards. In 1717, a vote passed for the employment of a grand schoolmaster for one year to instruct the children in the learned things who was to be paid and substituted at the town expense. And it goes on from there. Hmm. Hmm. So, okay. what from what I've always thought now, you two correct me, but my read if I'm wrong, but from my reading of the diary, what I've always thought was that Joseph, for the most part, takes Freeman's job when he comes from your, from Harvard to teach 1718, and then Freeman dies in 1723, and he does seem pretty sick. So even if he was still teaching, I don't think he was doing too much teaching during the last years of his life. Now, it may be that he was still teaching younger children, which I hadn't thought of. But after Freeman's death, Joseph in the diary notes that he's teaching younger children. Yeah. Right. Uh, he had been teaching younger children earlier, too, though. But he is very frustrated by it in the latter part of the diary yeah. after Freeman's death. And maybe that he had to take on these young students that Freeman was uh, teaching. Yeah. And, and so then he would have been he would have taken over the schoolhouse, too, probably. Probably, yeah. 
and which, Although, was, which was close yeah. to the, was that and that was very close to the meeting house i don't know yeah i i've well, never as, seen as i said as i said the, uh, the the reference that i see it seems to indicate that it is uh, mm -hmm. close proximity yeah yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. And so for for our viewers it's important to realize also that he was in so joseph was part of the second parish church eventually uh, it might be jumping eventually through. yes but he was he was all he was very he was all over the place and it was it seemed to be oh, yeah. interesting yeah okay it was very well traveled I and mean, joseph travels many more miles in the four years of, uh, of the diary than i have traveled in, in my last four years uh <laughs> anyway. yeah um Wait, wait, you went to England. What do you mean? And, I mean, well, okay, yes. Going going to England probably beats Joseph, yes. But if you take the England could, trip I probably out, could be the one who says that Joseph's traveled more than I have, right? Oh, yeah, he definitely has. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know there's one point where he says that his, his father departs for Newbury on foot? So right. I mean, the guy is basically walking down to Massachusetts. He just walks I mean, to uh, Boston. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard for us to imagine what what uh, what that w would have been like, right? Right. All right. Yeah. Well, well, and uh, my grandmother used to tell me she would walk to Portsmouth from Cape Medic, and I was right. like, "What do you mean?" And that was probably in the 1920s, 1930s. She was talking about. And that's wow. unbelievable to me. But and I said, how'd you get back? And she'd say, I walked back too. And I'd be like, wow. Yep. <laughs> well, yep. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Well, you know, I, I think the conditions being what they were, I mean, it was probably just a very leisurely kind of a walk, kind of a pleasant experience. Yeah. It must have been pleasant, I think, for the most part. And Joseph mentions riding with uh, people and walking with people to Kittery, to Portsmouth. Um, and he often says, I talk pleasantly with someone, with someone who joined me on my uh, journey. You know, and, and every time he goes down to Massachusetts, he goes yeah. to Newberry and he visits with all the kindred. And, and so he, every time he goes down there, he, he would go to the households of people that, you know, he's well acquainted with and spend time with them and so forth. Yeah. So it must yeah. have been, you know, I think um, it and, must and, have been quite, so, quite pleasant for him. So, so Danny, I'd like you to paint us a picture of what it was like to go to his yes. father's sermon, probably exactly attended, um, when he came back from Harvard, and now he's kind of settling uh, in the town, trying to find his place, um, and he goes to church on Sunday, and what's that like? All right, yeah, so I think the diary does give us a pretty detailed view as to what it was, was like, probably our, our best view for the whole period of church life in York from its founding until... Uh, uh, through the end of the, the 1700s. Um, and from the diary, what we see is that there was the meeting on Sunday, and then there was an ordinary meeting on Wednesday too. And at both of these meetings, oh, on the Sunday meeting from the diary, it seems that there were two sermons preached. And I think this was ordinary in, in, in most other New England towns too. There were two sermons preached. One in the morning, and then there was a break probably for lunch, dinner, as it was called. Joseph always calls it a dinner, and that's the, the old style. Breakfast in the morning, dinner in the middle of the day, and then supper at the end of the day. Um, and so there's probably a break for dinner, and then they came back to the meeting house for a second sermon in the evening. On Wednesday, it seems that there was usually one sermon, from what I can tell from the diary, probably in the morning. Um, and then on various other days, sometimes I think on Thursday is a popular day, Samuel or, or Joseph would, would preach a, a sermon too. So they could preach a sermon whenever they wanted to. They could call a special sermon day. Um, and there, there were also special fast days in which fast day sermons would be preached. Mm -hmm. And then there were thanks uh, giving days, which is sort of the opposite of a fast day, to give thanks to God rather than a fast day to plead with God to help them out. Um, and on both of those days, there would be a special sermon preached. But those could be on uh, any day. But there was the ordinary sermons then on Wednesday and on the Sabbath, as Joseph calls it, Sunday. And uh, there was also singing, too. Joseph mentions singing quite, uh, I think, probably the ordinary course of the, of the meeting was that they would sing a psalm 
maybe a him, and this is a question I, I've often thought about, because the, the ordinary view of Calvinist meetings in England is that the only things that were sung were psalms, and that hymns were outright banned as being too Catholic seeming, too uh, mm, papist. That's, yeah, that's true. But, yeah. And so Joseph mentioned singing at the meeting. So I, when I first read the diary, I just thought that they would sing, be singing psalms in the Calvinist style. However, there is one entry, which I, for the first time, noticed on this most recent read-through of the diary, in which Samuel says to, to Joseph, here is a, a hymn, which I just thought of. Maybe you could help me write this hymn. Um, and then Joseph says he feels bad because he didn't want to, he didn't think the hymn was, was very good. Um, so there, there is then in, in that entry, there is Samuel, who was, you know, probably a more strict Calvinist than his son Joseph, um, was at least open to him singing. And of course, Samuel would become an ally of um, um, Wesley, the two, um, the two, the two, the two Wesley brothers, founders of the um, of the um, Methodist movement in the 1740s, uh, Charles Wesley and I forgot what was the other Wesley brother named. Uh, anyway, both of those two Wesleys were very much uh, were were very big. Uh, were very big hymn writers and the role of hymns in in the in the uh, Methodist church that they founded is is, is very strong um so it is possible then that there was hymn singing in the York and Joseph Bowie's meetings in the 1720s would there, would there have been an instrument accompanying them singing I I would think definitely not there probably wasn't one until the 1800s really uh, organs. No, I mean, uh, there was a yeah, there was a there was not. a Dublin there was a Dublin seminar. Uh, there was, there was, yeah, on on music, and it indicated that uh, uh, this the singing would not you know would not have had a and, and it it would have had a very strange sound to it. Um, yep. Right, it would have had a very yeah. strange sound to it. This is not modern singing. This is it was called the uh, plain style of. Plain, plain, yeah, plain style. It, it has a very strange sound to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a, somewhat think, beautiful. Do you think that there was yes. any kind of like homogeneity or um, confluence with native singing? Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm just looking up the name of the other Wesley here, Charles Wesley, and what says John Wesley? Sorry for the messes. I forgot about John. Uh, but your question there, yes. Native singing, that is, that is a question for which there is, I don't think any primary source evidence. Yeah, I don't think there is, but you know, this early singing, and it's only like say in the last 400 years, it had to evolve from something to now where we understand what pitch is. I mean, I don't even think they had a pitch pipe and they were just like, they must've all just started up, but they must've been inspired by something um, that they'd heard. Um, and then to, to be, if it was unharmonious, I mean, how long could they keep it up for? I, I'm just, just <laughs> I do, I do think that this style of singing was quite ancient, uh, yes, yes. by, by the 1700s, this has been practiced in England since at least the 1500s. Yeah. So, yeah. right. Yeah. So, so we can assume it was pleasant enough for them to continue on. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And there are still Baptist churches, which claim that they sing, they sing in this in this plain style, um, and you you can find you can find videos of of their singing on uh, do a, a Google search of, of that, and it is claimed that these Baptists, which who are called um, regular Baptists, old regular Baptists, are singing in the same style that you would hear mm. in Calvinist churches in the 18th century, 17th century, and mm. this is often called lined out singing, since in order to keep it. Uh, everyone, you know, focused on the song, maybe there would be one leader who would sing the line from the psalm or the hymn out, mm -hmm. and then everyone would echo the line back okay. to the leader. So, so it's called was, lined did, singing. Did they, did they use notation, do you know? Um, no, yeah. from what I can tell, they wouldn't have used it. Okay. We know Joseph was a, uh, a, a good singer. I mean, certainly was a, a fan of uh, singing. 
Yeah. There, there are references. Barry there are often. references. Well, uh, there are references to music, music locations for music in the first parish church in the late last quarter of the 18th century. And so, um, indeed, indeed, there was uh, there was singing in First Parish Church in in the 18th century from from that source. Oh, I, I cool. have it, I have it derived from the church records. So there's no question about that. No, no question of singing. Yeah. The question is, were they singing psalms only, or were they singing hymns too? I think hymns definitely by the end of the 18th century, but by the earlier part of the 18th century. I think I, don't know. I think over the course of the 18th century, they. I believe in New England they they produced a a, a hymn book. Yeah, yeah. And so Joseph was said to have just he sang earlier and then he just stopped um, at the early part of his life. Yes, there there is that. Yeah, I, I was going to mention that. I forgot which source. I think this is part of the folklore, the folklore around Joseph Woody, which we'll be talking later about how that fits into the the image that we get from the from the primary sources, but at least in the folklore that I've read, after his breakdown in the 1730s, he stopped singing. He, he stopped really inter, interacting with the public. But there is the mention that, uh, there is the, the story that when he died, he was heard singing on the, the day that he died. Uh, and he wasn't, he was just singing in, in, his, in his room. And then he was found dead there later. Um, yeah, Banks writes that. Banks, I think, yes, that's yeah. where I, I wrote it. I don't know what Banks' source is, right? Yeah. Uh, so pretty, so, pretty, pretty sad. Pretty sad. Yeah, the, the whole story of Joseph Moody is really sad. Um, yeah. Yeah, Bank, Banks writes um, he was at Bragdon's house. Um, uh, he would know Bragdon's house, yes. Yeah, and and this is this is jumping way ahead, but we've brought it up, so I'm just gonna go through with it. At length, one day, which he spent alone in his chamber at Bragdon's house, he was heard to break forth into singing to the great astonishment of the Bragdon family. Almost the entire afternoon he was singing with great animation the 17th hymn of the first book of Watts hymns. And then the line that he was singing was, Oh, for an overcoming faith to chair my dying hours. And then Banks writes, he did not come out of his chamber that night and the next morning was found dead in bed. We do know from his diary that he seems to sing when he's in a really good, good mood or at least singing puts him into a, a happier mood than is normal in the diary. So that may be a, a, a hopeful sign of, of, his, of how he felt at the time of his uh, death. Yeah. Um... So we're, we're kind of getting up towards an hour. Um, we got oh, yes. before we, hit, before we hit the hour, we got like 10 more minutes, but like, do you, so we were going to talk about this folklore aspect of um, yeah. that how, how the things transpire to create a legacy of somebody, which might be mostly fictitious. And I know like, you know, the handkerchief is one thing. There is very little evidence to support. That yes. Um, there is obvious. one source. But, 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 which... so, so yes. probably, but but I'm just I just want to say that we we might need yes. to have a second segment. Um, I think yeah, maybe. Um, so. I mean, I'm I'm willing yeah to keep talking for more than an an hour here, but um. okay. okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I I personally, you know, I'd like to read the diary again. I I yep. you know, uh, and dig even deeper in terms of of uh, items that could be yeah. a subject to discussion. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the folklore aspect, we, we, we should certainly talk about that a little bit. I did want to finish up my talking about going to church in Joseph Moody's York. Awesome. And, he, and he wouldn't have, he would have called it meeting, as I, I mentioned earlier. Although there is one entry where he does, in the diary, I know this is for the first time in my recent reading through of it, he does use the word church, which is interesting. It was probably the Latin word church. Um but normally, of course, meeting house would have been used, church being seen as a, a Catholic building, which they wouldn't have wanted to have in, in, in their town. Um, and so it wouldn't be called going to church. It would be go called going to the meeting. And so we have the, the singing 
and then we have the sermon. And it seems from the evidence of uh, sermons from this period is that these sermons would be pretty long. They'd be probably hours long, right? Um, and prayers too. Now, prayers are a different type of speech than sermons. I think there'd be prayers as well as sermons in uh, during these meetings and at, at private family meetings too. Joseph mentions family prayer quite often. And actually, as as Banks I think talks talks about uh, Woodwell too. Joseph was very famous for his uh, for his personal prayers. And he was famous for his sermons too. But he was seen as notably skilled in praying. And so what he would do is he would go at a, a, a meeting, he would just say, usually without any written notes, this is what he was most famous for, as his father was too, without anything written, he would just pray for a certain, for a certain cause. Um, and there are short prayers that he has in, in his diary. Uh, of course, so uh, if you were, were listening to him during his lifetime, these prayers would have maybe been been hours long. And, well, and and he's yes, um, he's praying with those who are dying. Yes, indeed, he's praying with the families of those who are dying. I mean, October twenty fourth, seventeen twenty two, Will Moore came, begging me to go to his only son, now at the point of death. Um, as I said before, I think that. This constancy of having to deal with death uh, because of the position that he held, and the fact that every time that he entered, you know, a household, it was under these circumstances of someone in that household dying. I mean, yes. I, I think it's I think it's a psychic burden that he confronts. Yes. He, that was probably you're, you're you're totally right. That was probably the most numerous instance of prayers, type of prayers in his diary are these prayers that he gives either at someone's death deathbed or at the burial of someone he's called upon to uh, pray. That's probably right. the most common prayer right. that he gives in, in the diary. Uh, so this, this would have been a, certainly a very, very burdensome, I think, to his, his mental health to be uh, linked so closely to the deaths of this Still, pretty small town, less than a thousand people. I well, think as in I said, the 1720s. There, there are periods. There are periods of time where there are people dying on a weekly basis. Yes, especially smallpox when smallpox hits. And you know, children and small children dying again and again and again. Infants dying again and again and again yeah. on a weekly basis. And I just think that uh, for 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 some individuals, that, that's probably just too much. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah. um, uh, Junkins says that there's no real evidence of the impact of yes. the, um, you know, the of the shooting. And yeah, yeah. What, yeah. What, what's interesting is I found something that I uh, made a note of because I think it's really worth looking at in, in detail. Um, yeah. So this is May 25th, 1723. Spent five hours with my pupils. I did, in a few words, instruct them on the uncertainties of death. Scarcely, however, though, entire weeks, months, or years do I do myself reflect on my own death, nor when and may it arrive. It is presumed to be on its way. Now, what is interesting about this is at this very same entry, if you follow it through, he then says, the Moses Hubbard shot to death by accident, firing a pistol, another man. It's the same so, entry. Uh, right. I didn't realize that. The same entry, May 25th, 1723. So I think that, I think every time he confronts death, he deals with the fact of this accident that occurred when, when he was growing up. And he, and he deals with the fact, I think he deals with the fact over and over again, you know, over the course of his career. And I just think, I think it's just too much for him to handle. And, and also the insecurity of his inability to convert. Right. You know, oh, yeah. So he, he feels and like he's, I think, still, he, he's not I really, think that, yeah. Let me just say, he, I don't think he feels like he's a full representative yeah. of what he's trying to convey 
And even even worse, he feels that he's he's uh, lying because yeah, he mentions right. he's often a, that people he, he, think he's, he's more he's pious than he is. He's a phony. So yeah. it's not like he's going there with the, the embodiment of Christ himself. He's going there as this, like, he doesn't know where he is. He's lost. He says again and again in the diary, I see nothing. I feel nothing. Yeah. Insensibility. Insensibility. Why don't I feel anything when I'm, you know, hearing, you know, someone preach? Why don't I feel anything when, you know, my grandmother died? I yeah. feel nothing yeah. about my grandmother's death. Why don't yeah. I feel anything? And you see, I, I think, I think looking at him, you know, in some kind of way where you try to understand his personality, an individual who deals with death like he's having to do on such a constant basis has to form some kind of a of a a means of a of a of a barrier for himself yeah. Yeah. from his yeah. emotions getting completely overwhelming. And Which, I think that you know this is where he finds himself he finds himself in this situation where I think he has you know deep deep emotions about all of these things but he realizes that that he can't afford to to express those emotions it's 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 just a, he doesn't have the temperament for it i think his father no. has a different temperament i think he can handle it but i don't think he can hmm. yes. I, don't think he can. I, I do want to make a, a note for some of our viewers who may not know about the um incident that we've been referencing in joseph's youth which is when in 1708, the diary of a, a minister at Dover, John Pike, this is Pike's diary, a very detailed diary too, not as long as Joseph Moody's, but also an excellent source for a slightly earlier period of time. He writes that in 1708, young Joseph Moody by accident with a pistol, I think, shot a, a young boy named, um, um, Ebenezer Preble, who was 12 years old. And this was when Joseph was eight years old. And so this is the only source we have for that, but it's, a, you know, I think it's probably accurate. Um, and this definitely, I think people have often speculated about how this accidental death, what it would have meant for Joseph and for his mental breakdown in the 1730s. And sometimes you do, in fact, in the earliest references to Joseph uh, in the 1800s, it's usually noted that his breakdown and the veiling of his face incident was directly caused by this, sh by this, uh, by this uh, shooting death when he was eight. And it's certainly plausible. I think that as we'll be talking about, there were multiple factors. This was probably one of the factors. And that entry that James found where he does mention the uh, similar incident, and then he's talking about death with his, with his pupils on that same day. I think that definitely is, is very good evidence that shows this was still weighing on him. As of course, it naturally makes sense. It would have. I think this probably happened in the Preble Garrison which of course, this is my theory, which is where the uh, dig is uh, going on now. This was during the uh, war, as James mentioned. They were probably Moody and this Preble boy and their families crowded into this, this garrison. And there are probably guns lying around everywhere. And this is probably, he just they were playing with the pistol and he, he killed the boy yeah, yeah. by in, accident. In, in Banks, Banks says that he was out hunting um, yeah, I don't know. What yeah, sources. Some cracking in the woods. I don't know where that story came from, but that's what Banks. Wrote. I think Banks made made it up. That's why. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think somebody has to. Um, but that, yeah, that and that goes back to the folklore thing. It's like, okay, how did we yes. get here? And yeah, but I think that you know the three of us definitely have empathy for Joseph Moody um, more than oh, anything yes. else. Um, yes, it, it's 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 really it's 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 about a tragic. From what I have for information, it's a, about a tra his life is a tragic life. Um, yes, and, and Kevin, I did because you you're you're the one asking us you know questions, but I did want to ask you one too, because for um, both of us, James James and I, we've I I first read this diary back in 2015. I think James read it 
earlier than that. So we, about, we, I, read, we, I read about 1992, I guess. In 92. All right. So we've, 1993, we've known this. 1993. <laughs> 93. All right. So we, we have known this, this diary for many years, but I believe you read it for the first time quite recently. Yeah. So as someone who has just read this diary for the first time, I was wondering what what stood stood out to you most. Uh, the person, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, the person, I, I've, I've had like a catharsisism, I guess. I, I was like, I only knew the folklore about Joseph Moody, you know, from what I've heard. And I'm kind of informed about, you know, York history, but not recent. I haven't looked, I haven't read this before. And when I see people disparaging on him saying, you know, he was sworn to, to uh, silence and he wore the mask. I'm like, whoa. When I've read this and I've become familiar with it, I'm like, this is unfounded with all of this folklore. And then I, I realized that this is just a bleak picture of a person that, you know, maybe had some physical problems and was so psychologically impaired and probably suffered from PTSD. And as I've been reading this, I just have only empathy for him. And I'm like, it's really sad. And then I'm like, then I think of it and I think of Mary Nason in a similar way. Somebody has made this big, has painted this false picture of her. Um, and that's, and people are infatuated with this stuff. And the more that it becomes like part of their, their legend or their um, legacy, um, the more the sadder it gets. Um, because, you know, Joseph Moody was, he had all these benefits as a young child, except for maybe he shot the, his childhood friend, which would, mm. you know, create trauma and stress throughout the rest of his life. And we can speculate. I think that's a really good hypothesis. That's what happened to him. Um, but other than that, he was privileged and he, uh, yes. he grew up in a well-to-do family and, or, it's, you know, pretty well-to-do comparatively. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, so I'm like, I, I feel like, you know, we need to protect the, the legitimate legacy of him as that we can find of him and not just contribute to this um, speculation that, you know, he, 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 of something that he probably wasn't. Right. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think Hawthorne is a major source of that folklore. Yeah. Uh, the minister's black veil. Yeah. Yes. You, know, you know, and Hawthorne is such a great writer. I, I you know, um, when I just yeah. read the Scarlet Letter last year, I was actually blown away by that. And, and I'm, but I'm looking at, but then I'm like, wow, how could that guy write so good? And then when I look at handkerchief Moody's or Joseph Moody's, and, and I think handkerchief is actually a disparaging term also. Yeah. Um, but when I look at Joseph Moody's writing, I'm like, wow, he could not write like Hawthorne. Um, but that's well, just, in his diary, no. In his no. sermons, he's a little bit, a little bit better. Yeah, so yes. maybe, maybe you can point me to a sermon sometime. That I yes, I, I, I am. Well, actually, yeah, reference. So there's a quick note on, on his sermon. So Samuel Moody published, he had his sermons printed. And so we have hundreds of pages of sermons of Samuel that he published. Yeah. Now, Joseph never, never had any of his sermons printed. However, there are a series of sermons which were written up by a Bragdon. I forgot what his first name was, but one of the Bragdon family uh, in, the, in 1728 and 1727. This is a sermon book, which is very, a very, it's a hundred over 150 pages. I, oh, I, I wow. think. And it is basically a handwritten book of sermons that this man bragged and heard. And he presumably took shorthand notes. This is a very common practice. He took, and Joseph mentions this in the diary too. Uh, he also does it. He took shorthand notes and then he wrote out in a nice cursive script the content of the sermons that he heard. Yeah. And these are and on the note on the front cover of, of this book. There's a note that says, sermons of Samuel or Joseph Moody. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a man who was a minister at the First Parish Church in the 70s and 80s who wrote a PhD on Joseph Moody. What was, what was his name again, James? Oh, um, yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, um, hold on, I can get it. Yes, and so this- th It's this, an acknowledgement here, right? Yeah, so uh, this- yeah. This man who did a PhD on Joseph Moody, I think, was the most well, you know, research probably studied, well researched yeah. person on Joseph ever. Huh. And he says that these sermons were almost certainly Joseph's sermons, not yeah. Samuel's. Uh, Reverend uh, Raymond uh, Wilbur. 
Yes, Raymond Wilbur, the Reverend Raymond Wilbur. Yes. And he wrote a, a PhD thesis called The Diary of the Damned on Joseph Moody, which if you want to learn more about Joseph, I would recommend reading that. Certainly. Oh, that's right. That's right. You you read that for the uh, Patients Boston? For my Patients Boston paper, I read this PhD thesis first. It's 500 pages on Joseph uh, and his diary and his sermons. It's very detailed. Well, then and the question I very, can ask you, because uh, I haven't read yes. that dissertation. I yes. mean, do you see any confirmation of what I've uh, advanced as a uh, explanation? For his breakdown in the 1730s? Well, as they say, the, the, the fact that he's confronting death mm. on such, with such yes. frequency and that he just uh, doesn't have right. the temperament for it? I, I'd say that Wilbur doesn't think about Moody's life in, in those terms. He thinks about it in very narrow the, theological terms. He views... Moody's in, entire mental life and his his mental um, mental breakdown, his mental illness, in terms of a conflict in Joseph's mind between Calvinist doctrines or Protestant Protestant doctrines, whether he should follow his father's strict uh, strict Calvinism of um, the bondage of the will, right? And being predestined to hell or, or to heaven and going through certain stages to find out whether you have been uh pre whether you have been pre whether you have been predestined, which is represented by the theology of Shepherd, which Moody mentions reading Shepherd and being mm, petrified yes, quite quite yeah, often. And so Wilbur is saying basically you have that the theology of Shepherd and Samuel Moody, and then you have the free will theology which is saying that, no, the will is not bound. You can work out, you have the free choice to, in your lifetime, your works will de determine whether you are saved or damned. And so Moody has this crisis where he, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, I think, where he's so stressed out by the fact that although he's trying his best to be saved, He's also reading in Shepherd and being told by his father, listening to his father's sermons and reading other uh, books of uh, theology too, that nothing he can do will alter his predestined fate. And so this sort of dual forces of being told on the one hand, you have to work your best to be saved and you have to live as sinless and pure a life as possible. On the other hand, being told that you've already been pre predestined to be saved or not, he just couldn't reconcile Wilbur argues these two forces so Danny, and that led to his breakdown. So, so Danny is Puritanism evolving into this free choice thing? Um, is it? Yeah, as, definitely. Yeah. So as, so, and so how is Samuel Moody dealing with this? Okay. This is a, that's a very complicated question. Um, it seems that ultimately it's such a difficult question that you have the, um, a sort of, um, um, evangelical surge uh, in the 1730s, 1740s, um, Whitfield oh, so, being so at that, the forefront that, of it. Excuse me, but is that revivalism? Yes, yes definitely. Okay. Revivalism. Uh, yeah, I was hoping you talk about that for a minute. Yes, and that's, that's, that's at the center of your question, because yeah. that is the movement that changes the face of the Congregationalist Church in um, the... Um, New England colonies. Okay. And it's somewhat, I would argue, and I could talk about this for a long time, but <laughs> it's a very complicated topic. I would argue that it answers this question by just blowing past it. Uh, um, so you have Whit, uh, George Whit, Whitfield and uh, Gilbert Tennant and many other traveling evangelical ministers who take their colonies by storm in the 1740s and they are preaching they are what they are preaching is that you have to be confident that you have been saved otherwise you will be damned and so in some ways on the surface this is no different than what calvinists have been saying since the yeah. time of calvin right on the other hand it's quite different in that there's an urgency to it whitfield is saying you have to know that you've been saved now. And so the process that Joseph is trying to go through in this diary that he's been told, he reads in Shepherd, 
will take years is now being shortened into maybe hours. Whitfield is saying, during the course of my sermon, you will know whether you have been saved. And you have, you have to, to know that. If you don't know that, then you are, you are damned. And so you have people go to flock to these traveling ministers, hear these sermons, go through a uh, very um, emotionally draining process, and then come out of these sermons confident that they have been saved. Yeah, because, and so be, this because is, they have a recognizable conversion experience. Yes, it happens right? to them. Yeah, it, it was and, like it was like evangelism yeah. on TV when I was a kid. Billy Graham. Used exactly. To yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think there it it, it led in a direct line to yeah. Billy, Billy Graham, um, and so for Joseph, this is quite foreign to him, and it um, sort of obviates the previous issue, the previous question, um, because there's just, you know now whether you have been saved or damned. And so there's no question of searching yeah. for it. Yeah. And so it makes what Joseph's doing old fashioned. It sort of gets rid of the whole issue. He says on June 9th, 19, uh, 1723, every feeling of mine is fallacious. Yes. As if it's just something that he doesn't trust. He doesn't believe that it is sincere. Yeah, and so that's his issue. He, he can never be absolutely certain. Yeah. Um, Whitfield talks to, 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 to Joseph when he comes uh, to York. And so Samuel Moody is a um, um, Whitfield follower, um, oh, really? Whitfield Darien, as they were called in the 1740s. And he is a great friend of him. Um, Whitfield comes to York in 1740, comes to York in 1744. Uh, and he, he comes, talks he to, comes to York just days before he dies in, 17, in the 1770s. Yes. I mean, in 1770, he makes a final trip. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think Samuel Moody uh, buys into this uh, full heartedly. And Samuel preaches sermons along, the, uh, along these same lines in which and there's a diary of a Boston merchant who comes to York in 1740. He says Samuel Moody is preaching, uh, you know, five hour long sermons in which there were thousands of people. Yeah, there, there are these impromptu uh, revival meetings going yes. on in the 1740s. And this is Samuel Moody. You know, he's in his 80s by now or in his 70s, but he's still preaching in yeah. this new new style in wow. which people act as if they've been struck in the this this uh, diarist says that people uh, act as if they've been struck by um, lightning. And so they, they fall down as if they're dead. Then they come back up again. Um, and they, at the yeah, end of the sermon, highly, are confident highly they've been saved. Highly emotional revivalism where you see these yes. uh, spectacles of individuals you know, behaving in, in very strange ways. Yes, and Joseph does not take part in this. He's mentioned it in this diary as being present with his father, you know, at, as he's living, uh, no, the, he's living at, at Bragdon's house at the time. I think this is the house where he dies at. And there's a, a meeting where his father is preaching at, at this house, one of these sermons. And he's mentioned as being there, but not as taking part in it. He's be, mentioned as being under uh, great darkness is the quote. So he is not buying into this um, new um, evangelical, so, uh, movement. So at this time, if you were to go to Harvard to become a, a minister, you would come out with this revivalism approach. <laughs> um, there was said, massive no, controversy at there, Harvard. Yeah, there was there was yes. severe uh, reaction against this. You know, too. Uh, first of all, first of all, the itinerants were were you know a deep source of uh, of trouble because they were coming from all different locations and they weren't settled ministers and there were objections to the fact that they weren't settled ministers. So no, it, uh, wow. it, it divided, it divided the religious community. Did it, did it split the, the Puritan church? Oh yeah, definitely. It split the uh, church. That was probably created, the most important thing that it happened. Created this, it created this division between old lights and new lights. Yeah. And, well, and, and the Chauncey down in, in, in Boston was one of the leaders of, of this uh, group that was most strongly opposed to uh, to the revivalism. 
the old lights. Yeah. So the second parish and the first parish went with revivalism. Yeah. And it so, seems so. Yeah. So Joseph, while he was there, so the last seven years of his life, he he, he preached there like some of the last years of his life, right? He was hired. Yes. Um, yeah. So so yeah. actually, so, um, you know, we could we could wrap things up right now. I think we're in a good place yes. to do that. I did want to say Wilbur's thesis. This is what Wilbur talks about in, yeah. in his in his, in his okay. thesis. And why why was I talking about that anyway, though? It will, it will bother me if we don't figure this out <laughs> be, before we, we end. Why did I mention that? I, I asked you a question about. Uh, well, what was the, the question? Because I was almost at the answer to it. The um, best thing is we can always uh, scroll here we back. Can always and, check and... it. <laughs> yeah. What was my question? answer um yeah i can't remember it's too, too much stuff in my head right now. <laughs> james you can't remember james do you remember oh, well uh, well i remember uh, asking the question where i yeah. said that uh, what was wilbur's uh perspective on on you know events yeah. in Moody's yeah. life and and oh. uh, was there confirmation oh from, i from i i remember what it was it was Joseph's sermons. So I mentioned Wilbur because he writes that this manuscript sermon book is almost certainly Joseph Moody's sermons. Yes. And so this sermon book, which the old, old York archive has a microfilm of, and I believe it's held in Boston. The actual book is in a, an archive in, in Boston. And this is, so these are almost certainly Joseph Moody's sermons, 150 pages. Yeah has not been published in print, but I have I have been reading through them and typing them them out. And so this this sermon book gives us, I think, like the diary, a, a very detailed view into Joseph's life, which has yeah. not been analyzed as deeply as the diary. Wow, wow. So we're gonna have to wait for you to transcribe those, it sounds like. Yes, I'm working on it. Okay. So you, so you guys, okay, I think we could wrap up right now and um, the next segment, if we decide could be on Scotland area, um, Joseph Moody Second Parish. I think there's a lot to cover in that segment. Mm. Um, so it sounds good. Okay, so there's um, a lot more to talk about, definitely in the in the diary oh. too. <laughs> I know, but I feel like we're leaving it at a good place. We haven't exhausted it, and we're not like we haven't beat it. Um, oh, I'm in, I'm intrigued by the uh, Second Parish, yeah, and it's it's radicalism in the Revolutionary period. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, the, and I, I do want to talk about my patient's Boston paper, which ties directly into Joseph Moody too. Yes, and so we were going to have. Hopefully, I'm going to have you and Hannah, Hannah on. Yeah, um, are you going to make that document available um, for people to read? I have read it, um, by the way, and it's yes. it's totally amazing. Um, that was another thing that I was reading. That and I was just like, oh my gosh, there's so much. That is so context rich. Um, you know, her up on the gallows, just um, smart. I mean, she had complacent. Well, wow, wow, that's a yes. great story. She um, was smiling, and Joseph was was not smiling. Yes. So, is, so are you gonna, is what's that happening gonna be, there? Is that going to be available? Um, well, it's going to be published by a, a journal uh, very uh, very soon, is what they've told me. I would say probably within the next month or two. So once once it's published, and I'll then I'll be able to published into a book uh, form. A, a, a journal, yeah. It will be in a, a journal, so it'll be printed. But I'll also have a, a you know, you know a digital have you seen, PDF file. Have you seen in the in the diary? There's a reference to his being present at the execution of a yes um, of of a black man. Yes, yes, he mentioned that. Which and, and now that I've written the paper, kind of a, uh, what's that? Now that I've written the paper on Patients Boston, that really stood out to me that he is at the public hanging of this this black man in Boston. Right. In 1723, and he goes to the sermon that this man listens to, the uh, gallows sermon, mm -hmm. wow. which he would then give, or at least Samuel Moody, he would be present. Uh, he would help Samuel Moody give the gallows sermon of Patience Boston wow. in 1735, 10 years later. Mm -hmm. So that that's definitely something which really stood out to me that I didn't really integrate into the paper. So I'm going to I'm going to be talking to Hannah about how we can Okay, so because there's a very, uh, there's, there seems to be at the final moments of this individual's life, this kind of uh, religious awakening he describes. Exactly, exactly, and that happens to patients too. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so um, <laughs> Danny, I'll talk to you uh, separately about scheduling that um, and yes. uh, your convenience when you and Hannah are available. And uh, definitely. So Danny Bettino and James Kensis, thank you so much for uh, joining us on York History Group. I'm Kevin Freeman, and we love all of our members, and uh, we appreciate everybody that keeps putting stuff up on the on the Facebook page. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, oh, and and uh, just let them know that there's a summary of the third week of the excavation that's been posted this morning. Yes, and uh, yes, and James, I wanted to thank you for doing all of those uh, updates for us all because it is such a mystery to everybody that just keeps driving by and seeing this big white tent out there, and we know. And, and if they if they want a, a printed version, I'm I'm going to have them available at the at the library counter. Okay. Well, I know so many people appreciate you doing that. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, if you guys hang on for a second, I'm just going to log out of Facebook here. Good night, everybody.